see all of you here this evening. A uh, couple quick announcements before we begin. First is that um, Easter flowers, uh, the order forms for those are still back there on the uh, little cubicle <coughs> right before you head into Fellowship Hall. Uh, we have until April 3rd to order those, but uh, please be thinking about that opportunity to help decorate for Easter. We greatly appreciate the help with that. Also, we continue uh, again after this service and each Wednesday, beginning at 5 with our service and then a soup and salad supper afterwards. So please plan on joining us afterwards over at Fellowship Hall for that as well. Uh, tonight, we're going to continue our overheard series with, um, well, we'll have to wait and listen to see who we're hearing from tonight. But um, I pray that it will be meaningful to all of us as we overhear these conversations and as God continues to speak to our hearts. If you would, please rise as we sing our opening hymn, How Firm a Foundation. <laughs> serves me, the Father will honor him. Our first reading is from Psalm 14. Fools say in their hearts, there is no God. They are corrupt, and they do abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on mankind to see if there are any who are wise, who seek after God. They have all gone astray. They are all like, alike perverse. There is no one who does good. No, not one. Have they no knowledge? All the evil doers who eat upon my people as they have bread, as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord, they, are, they shall be in great terror. For God is with the company of the righteous. You would confound the plans of the poor, but the Lord is their refuge. Oh, that deliverance for Israel would come from Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, Jacob will rejoice. Israel will be glad. We sing.
gospel for this evening is from Luke chapter 23. Then the assembly rose as a body and brought Jesus before Pilate. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this man perverting our nation, forbidding us to pay taxes to the emperor, and saying that he himself is the Messiah, a king. Then Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered, You say so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no basis for an accusation against this man. They were insistent and said, He stirs up the people by teaching throughout all Galilee, for all Judea, from Galilee where he began, even to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he had learned that he was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him off to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had been wanting to see him for a long time, because he had heard about him and was hoping to see him perform some sign. Questioned him at length, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him. Even Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then he put an elegant robe on him and sent him back to Pilate. That same day, Herod and Pilate became friends with each other. Before this, they had been enemies. Pilate then called together the chief priests, the leaders, and the people and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was perverting the people, and I have examined him. Uh, I and here I have examined him in, him in your presence and have not found this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither is Herod, for he sent him back to us. Indeed, he has done nothing to deserve death. I will therefore have him flogged and release him. Then they all shouted out together, Away with this fellow! Release Barabbas to us! This was a man who had been put in prison for an insurrection that had taken place in the city and for murder. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again, but they kept shouting, Crucify! Crucify him! Third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no ground for the sentence of death. I will therefore have him flogged and then release him. But they kept urgently demanding with loud shouts that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate gave his verdict that their demand should be granted. Here ends our gospel. You may be seated. St. Paul once wrote, I do not do the good I want to do. But the evil that I don't want to do, I keep on doing. And what Paul is describing, I think, is a very common problem that we all have. I mean, it seems like it should be a pretty simple thing to fix. But you and I both know that it's not. It has to do with the difference between right and wrong, between good and evil. And in most cases, doing the right thing should be simple enough. So why don't we get it right? If we look at the Ten Commandments, that's probably a good starting point, right? We can read them and they look easy. Don't kill. Don't steal. And in most cases, the good thing to do, the right thing to do is pretty evident. But knowing the right thing to do is often much easier than actually being able to do it. We blame our failures, and maybe quite correctly, on the fact that the situations aren't always as easy and as simple as they seem on the surface. The right thing to do, if we can clearly Determinant isn't always the easiest thing to do, nor is it the most comfortable thing to do. In fact, the right thing to do may often be the most painful thing to do. 
Jesus himself is an example of that. Doing what was right, what needed to be done, the loving thing to do cost him his life. Pontius Pilate probably also serves as another good example of the high price that righteousness demands. And as we see from our gospel reading tonight, it's a price that he wasn't quite willing to pay. Matthew says that in the middle of Jesus' trial, Pilate received word from his wife telling him, don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I've suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. That's all we know about what she saw, about that interaction. We don't know, for example, if when Pilate got home back to his wife, uh, they had a discussion about what happened. But if so, we can probably imagine how it might have gone. I ask you right now to close your eyes and open your ears as we listen in to what may have been. Oh, you're home. Uh-huh. Did you receive my message today? Yes, it was delivered. And? And what? And did you release him as I had begged you? I'm sure you already know the answer to that. Yes, I do. I begged you not to have anything to do with that righteous man. I know. I got your message. Woman's dreams. It was a terrible dream. It upset me greatly. It upsets me greatly that because of a dream, of all things, you would interfere with the doing of justice. Perhaps we better not speak of justice, my husband. What do you mean by that? You condemned him to death, didn't you? Yes, I did. But why? What had he done to deserve death? He was a righteous man. Of course he was. There was never any question about that. The charges were trumped up. That was obvious. The whole thing was kind of a religious squabble. I never did find out what it was all about. We have a law, their counsel said, and according to our law, he ought to die. We have a law too, don't we? And according to our law, he ought not to have died. Yes, and that's exactly what I told him. I find in this man nothing deserving death. But then you let him be crucified. Why? For what crime was he put to death? Well, treason was the official charge. Treason? Where did you ever get an accusation like that? He was a righteous man. They said he claimed to be a king. And was he? He claimed to be. Did he really, himself? Yes, in fact he did. And did he threaten to overthrow all of Rome, or even to run you and your legions out of Judea, Pilate? Not exactly, no. He said something to the effect that his kingdom was not of this world, and that his followers had no intention of fighting for it wherever it is. That was the terrible treason against Rome? Woman, you know how these Jews are about their religious beliefs. Was he truly guilty of treason? That is what the inscription of accusation said over his head on the cross. It said treason? This man is guilty of treason? Not exactly. It said, this is king of the Jews. What is that, some kind of joke? Not at all. In fact, the chief priests and the leaders tried to get me to change the sign. They wanted it to sign, say, he claimed to be the king of the Jews, but I wouldn't budge. You wouldn't budge. What I have written stays written, I told them. You wouldn't budge. You let them maneuver you, the Roman governor, into condemning an innocent man to death, a righteous man, a man you yourself said was innocent. And then, when that injustice was complete, you suddenly get firm in your resolve and wouldn't change the words on a stupid signboard. What I have written stays written. And was he king of the Jews, as you wrote? Yes. Do you really believe that, Pontius? Yes. What I have written stays written. 
For if it were not true, then his blood would be on your hands, wouldn't it? No, as a matter of fact, that is not a problem at all. For I wash my hands of the whole matter. You what? Wash my hands. When they kept shouting for his crucifixion, even after I had rendered my considered judgment, I called for a bowl of water and I washed my hands. I am innocent of the blood of this just man, I told them. Yes, I washed my hands of the whole matter. Oh, did you really, Pilate? You rendered a judgment that an innocent man deserves to die, and that is not washing your hands of the matter. Yes, it is. They said his blood be on us and on our children. Who said that? The crowds, all of them. His blood be on us and on our children. And is it? Is it what? Is it the truth? Is his blood not on them and on their children just because you said so? Yes, guilt is absolved because I say so. That is exactly how it happens in my court. If I judge a man guilty, he is so. And if I judge a man innocent, then he is without guilt. Is he really without guilt? Of course he is. Or is he simply relieved for the moment of his punishment? What are you saying? That I'm not sure you can get rid of guilt just by saying so. I don't know why you insist on trying to hang this petty thing on me. Because you are a judge, Pontius, and a justice is expected of you. Well, he was the defendant, and he did not defend himself. When I questioned him at length, he remained silent. And did that make him guilty? After you had declared him innocent? I tried to set him free. You didn't try. I did try. When I found out he was a Galilean, I even sent him to Herod for judgment. Do you call that justice? Sending him to that petty pretender? I never thought I'd see the day. I never thought I'd see it either. But I will have to admit that Herod did conduct a fair and impartial hearing. And although it put the problem back in my hands, he actually deferred to my jurisdiction. Most polite and proper throughout, even cordial. Perhaps we have misjudged the man, my dear. He's not the only one you have misjudged this day, my dear. You needn't be sarcastic. But he was innocent, Pilate. Even Herod agreed. Innocent or guilty, he could have ruined everything for me. Oh, is that why you conduct your court, Pontius? To benefit you? To benefit Rome. Rome could have weathered this little storm, I suspect. It has dealt with worse. And the way it does so is through people like me. It is my job to keep the peace in Judea. And do you keep the peace by sacrificing the righteous? There was no easy decision that could be rendered in this matter. Don't you understand that? No, I don't. There are times in life where there are no good decisions possible, only choices among bad ones. And this was one of those times. What would have been so bad about releasing him? Don't you see, woman? There was no way out of this thing. If I had released him, there might well have been another riot. You know how volatile these fanatics are. They had threatened to inform Caesar. And is that worth the life of a righteous man? Of course it is. After all the things that have been happening in Judea, another incident could cost me my post, my career. Tiberius is not too fond of me to begin with. At the very worst, Given the climate of the times, my life could have been at stake. Aren't you being overly dramatic about the whole thing? Aren't you being overly dramatic about the whole thing? He was just one person, one little insignificant person. One righteous person. It was his life or mine. I'm sorry to, to disturb you, Excellency. Yes, what is it? Uh, well, you may recall, sir, that Joseph of Arimathea had requested the body of the criminal Jesus once the crucifixion was complete. Yes, I told him I would let him know. Why are you disturbing me here? Well, he has now been joined in his request by a man named Nicodemus, a member of the Sanhedrin, sir. Yes, I know who he is. 
I thought they had all voted that this Jesus was an outcast. They're waiting for your decision, sir. Both of them. Frankly, I'm surprised that a man like Nicodemus would want to be identified with this Jesus, especially now that the king of the Jews is hanging on a cross. I never would have expected it of him. Uh, do, do you have a reply, sir? Uh, yes. Tell them I'll be there presently. Yes, sir. Nicodemus, who would have thought taking a stand like that at a time like this could be political suicide? You would think he would be more prudent. I'll never understand what makes people do things like that. Yes, I'm sure you never will. What do you mean by that? Perhaps, my dear, this member of the Jewish council is concerned about something that seems to have eluded your courtroom in this case. The thing that has been bothering me all day. What are you talking about, woman? Another one of your dreams? No, Pilate. Unless the truth is only a dream. What is the truth? What is truth? It's probably unfair to make Pilate have to deal with that question twice in one day. I think we've probably put him through enough already, although maybe he deserves it. Among other things, though, according to the Bible, truth is something that you can rely on, something that remains firm and immovable, something that's solid and unchanging. In contrast to the truth are the things that can't be trusted because they shift. They slip, they slide, they become a slippery slope. And Pilate knew it. He knew this man, Jesus, was innocent. But Pilate didn't do what truth required. He didn't stand firm in what he knew to be true. Because doing, doing so might have been uncomfortable. Might have even been painful to do so. Nicodemus, on the other hand, now let, let's, let's not stop with Nicodemus as our example. Let's, let's go all the way to Jesus himself. Jesus knew the truth. He knew that the truth was that he was innocent. He knew the truth of our sinfulness, our hopelessness. Like our opening psalm said that no one does what is right. He knew the truth that we could not redeem ourselves no matter how hard we tried. He knew it. And because he knew it, he, he knew that because he knew what St. Paul had stated as well. I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil that I don't want to do, this I keep on doing. Jesus also knew the truth that he'd come into the world to the re redeem the world from its sin. And he knew that doing so would require him to surrender his own comfort, to forfeit his life. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so with Jesus as our example, we might be tempted to think that makes it so much easier for us to stand up for what we know is right and true and to act on that knowledge. You know what? Just because we might think that doesn't make it so. The truth is that following Jesus is hard. Following Jesus is difficult and often uncomfortable. Following Jesus is countercultural. It goes against the thinking and reasoning of this world. Following Jesus can even be painful and lead to death in this life. And just because he suffered unto death for us doesn't make it any easier for us 
to live following him, even though he is our example. It does, however, it does, however, give us a reason to keep trying again and again and again as we see Jesus, as we seek to be more like him, to surrender ourselves as he surrendered himself. The forgiveness which this righteous one offers us, the washing that covers more than just our hands, this isn't an idle dream to just think about or study or ponder. Jesus meant it to be something that causes a change within us. Change in the way we think and in how we act. The way we, we live life. His love, his sacrifice changes everything for us. So that we can be free. So that we can be free from that sin that so easily entangles us and binds to us. And instead be strengthened to stand up for the truth. His truth. No matter what the consequences we face may be. And that's the truth. May it be so in each of us, today and always. Amen. We sing our song of response. and your grace. We cannot trust ourselves, our own powers, or will, or the wishes of our hearts, for we are weak and sinful and powerless without your gracious aid. Do not enter into judgment with your servants, for in your sight no one shall stand. But send your Holy Spirit to us all to convict us of our sin and to convince us of your righteousness. Righteous, righteousness made freely ours through Christ who went in the way and the bitter and evil death that we might stand and walk our places before you. Show us then the way to walk, the things to do, the words to speak, the example to follow and to be. And when your way for us is hard, God, make us firm in our resolve and true in our response, faithful in doing the will of your will. Through him who kept your will, unbent and true for us, in whose name we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the light is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. What is truth? The truth is that the good we seek to do, we do not do. And the evil that we don't want to do, we keep on doing. 
That is who we are on our own. But we have one who came to take our place. The way, the truth, and the life. And in him he says to us, here it comes. You are my dearly loved child. And nothing can ever take that away from us. So that's what we live in each day. As we go out this evening, we go out to live as Jesus in this world. As you go out to do that, may he be with you and strengthen you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. 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 We sing our closing song. This evening in person, but we continue to go out and live a life of worship each and every day. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.